<coughs> good morning. Thanks very much. It's really good to be here. Um, okay, I've got quite a lot of material, so I'm going to go quite fast, uh, and hopefully I'll get it in in time. Um, right, start at the beginning. Uh, just to talk about a little bit of theory, um, a, a sim very simple land use model. Basically, what we're talking is about talking about a series of time steps, t zero to t n, and we're looking to uh, establish these key uh, things: how much how much land use is changing, uh, where is it changing, and how is it changing. <coughs> So cellular automata, why cellular automata? Well, basically this is something that arose out of the uh, Manhattan Project at Los Alamos in New Mexico in the, in the late 40s and 50s with these guys here, uh, Stanislav Ulam in particular on the left and John von Neumann on the right. Um, and this is basically a de Ulam's definition of cellular automata. Given an infinite lattice or graph of points, each with a finite number of connections to certain of its neighbours, each point is capable of a finite number of states. The states of neighbours at time Tn induce in a specified manner the state of the point at time Tn plus 1. This rule of transition is fixed deterministically or more generally may involve partly random decisions. So there's a lot of uh, talk in the modelling literature, the land use modelling literature about transition rules and states and neighbours and all of it uh, comes back to this. Well, then there were some sort of experiments by mathematicians in, uh, later on, like John Conway, who came out with a game of life, which I'm sure you've seen if you, if you know anything about cellular automata. It's a kind of classic example. Um, as far as actually applying this, these definitions to, uh, to geography, uh, we've got this guy on the right here, Waldo Toller, looking very relaxed in his retirement there in, in Santa Barbara in California. Um, and he basically said, well, yeah, we've, we're talking about a cell a cell could be a grid, it could be a map, and we could, uh, our cells could contain uh, land uses. Um, and <coughs> the mo I think probably the best, uh, the best known application of cellular automata is probably this by uh, Roger White and Guy Engelen, uh, about 20 years old now, um, and applied inside a, a major uh, standalone commercial software. So how, how, does, how does this model of uh, Engelen and White actually work. Okay, well basically you start with your initial land use map, which in the case I'm going to talk about today is 1956. You establish your neighbourhood rules. You have a uh, stochastic element, uh, this randomness that Olam was talking about. You have accessibility, which is your, usually your distance to roads or your infrastructure networks. Suitability, so the background um, kind of uh, carrying capacity, the capacity of, of, the, of the background land to support a land use. You don't get cereal crops on mountain tops. Um, urban areas, don't, uh, you don't build houses on cliff faces generally. And then you have your zoning, which could be your, your management, uh, your land planning, so protected areas. Um, and you calculate transition potential. And this transition potential is what allows you to calculate your new map at your next time step. Okay. Um, and the first thing we do is, uh, on a process we call calibration, we simulate our next land use map that we've got available, which in my case was 1999, so quite a long time step. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty simple. <laughs> it's a pretty straightforward uh, model. Um, so I'll just, just to talk about the neighbourhood dynamics. Okay, at the core of this uh, model by White and Engelin, um, we have the idea that this, the susceptibility of an individual cell C to change state at time Tn is a function of the influence of the cells in its neighbourhood. Okay? So we can make some observations. So when you do a land use change analysis, which is normally your starting point for this type of modelling, you see there's some changes that uh, you, you frequently uh, repeat themselves. So you don't, get non you don't get irrigated land that just turns up out of nowhere. Normally it's uh, farmland that uh, was not under irrigation. Yeah. Okay, and we could say that's attraction. That could be represented in our model as attraction in the cell neighbourhood. Um, some land uses are always separate. So generally, you find mining areas separate from urban land. That's not always the case, but mm, as a general rule, I think we can say that. And this would be repulsion. And then you have finally, you have some changes that never happen. Urban land changing into conifer forest. Mm, very, very rare situations this might happen. As a general rule, it doesn't tend to. Um, and this is an example of persistence. Some things nearly always stay where they are, and that's uh, uh, urban land is a good example of this. Well, here's the, this is the cell neighbourhood and the influence table. Um, basically, here we've got uh, 
our distances, 0 to 200, quite a small neighbourhood, and we've got the attractiveness of urban to these other classes. And in particular, I've highlighted in orange urban because I'm only going to talk about urban today in, in our model. So this is the attraction of urban to urban. And in order that in the second time step you get urban land where urban land was before, it needs to have a high value at zero on the cell itself. If you don't have a high value at zero, your urban land gets up and it walks across the map, <coughs> which you don't want. Okay, so in our, this is just, um, we generate a matrix. Uh, that's, that's our cell neighbourhood, and, and this is our, our, uh, our command in R. Um, stochasticity, right. Well, this is ULAM's, again, these partly random decisions. Well, human activity in the landscape, we know it's not completely deterministic. Some things, they're ra either they're random or, or we've got so many uh, unknown causes that effectively we, we have a kind of randomness. Um, how do we do it? Well, we actually make some parts of the simulated landscape more attractive at random. But we don't want much randomness because in general we're saying that human activity is more deterministic than random. But Okay, so we don't want to go overboard. Um, accessibility again. Well, this is this, uh, again, fairly simple equation from uh, Roger White's work in the 90s. Um, we take our, our raster dist a simple distance map from road net networks, which you could calculate in R or in another GIS, um, and we reclassify it just to give higher values to cells with, with uh, uh, closer distances. <coughs> Suitability, okay, this is what I was saying before, the intrinsic susceptibility of a cell to be occupied. Uh, so zoning, again, this is the institutional characteristics, so the planning restrictions and policies. Generally, these are stationary throughout the time steps. You, you could update them in an integrated model uh, to feed in from some other information you had. So aridity due to climate change here, for example. Um, in, in this example, I've not, I've not done any of that. It's stationary. Uh, what's the problem? Well, we've got, there's a really good CA land use uh, modelling system on the market called Metronamica. Um, it's quite expensive. Um, it's standalone. I, I should say, first of all, it's very good. Yeah. But it is expensive. It, it's standalone. Uh, if you want to do any GIS, you've got to go outside and do it in a different system. If you want to do your statistical goodness of fit testing, which should become more and more important with the model. So people who are just interested in finding out about these models are, are shut out. And so also are stakeholders, so the people that you might want to work with, uh, uh, if you're talking about land planning, uh, you might want to work with farmers or, or um, municipal authorities. Um, and it's very difficult for them to access this model. You have to buy it as part of your project and, you know, then give them results. And this is kind of, I think, a little bit of an idea that we <laughs> have from the 1990s that, you know, experts are going to come along and they're going to do policy support and then, you know, they're going to roll out this information and planners are going to implement it. And I think this is a little bit of an outdated philosophy. Other problem is Windows only. Um, there are some other uh, non-commercial applications they have some of these limitations as well. Um, and there are some commercial applications that I don't think are true cellular automata, like the land change model in Idrisi. They talk about cellular automata, and then you actually find that it doesn't really respond to any of these definitions that you have in from uh, Stanislav Ulam. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's debatable. I don't want to offend anyone, but <laughs> I don't think they're real cellular automata. So we wanted something that gives you f complete freedom to explore, that runs inside a widely used environment like our... And it responds to all these problems I was just talking about. And for me particularly, it was important because we work a lot with stakeholders. This is one of our, our workshops in Doniana, which is a natural area in the south of Spain. This is our, our website. So we're saying to them that, yes, everything's online. You know, go to the website. You can download everything, all the questionnaires, all the information. And at the end, we have to say everything. Ah, mm, oh, except the land use model. Sorry, you can't have that. That's licensed software. And that's not good enough, I don't think. So, um, right, first of all... <laughs> It's a prototype I'm going to present. Um, I can't compete with all this professional development that's gone in. I'm only dealing with one land use at a time. There's no graphic interface, a lot of development. But anyway, I'm going to put the code o online um, at this, uh, this blog. Um, it's not there yet. I've just set the blog up, so bear with me. Right, well, we've actually had quite a nice introduction to R anyway. Um, <coughs> uh, so, well, anyway, it's got a whole series of advantages, I think, for, for this. Uh, ease of data handling, for me, is absolutely great. I mean, you can bring in uh, a raster data, an ASCII file. You can take the values out. You can do a whole load of things to them. You can return them, and it doesn't screw it up. <laughs> so it's, it's, really, it's really, really good, that. Um, 
for this model I'm going to talk about, you don't need a very powerful computer. About a gig is probably enough of RAM. Um, and any operating system that runs, uh, that, that runs R, as far as I know, most of them do. Um, you need the raster package, um, AOD, SP, and SDM tools, just for the spatial analysis. So you don't need a great deal of additional stuff. Um, this is uh, the model that I've actually built is, is based in this area. As I was saying, this is south, uh, southwest Spain. This is a nat natural area called Doniana. Um, and I'm going to show some examples of uh, my land use simulations for the growth of this large town called San Luca de Barrameda. Um, <coughs> so right, land use demand. You need to know how much land is changing. Remember, I'm only going to be talking about urban land. So this is a binary map. Urban land is one, non-urban land is zero. And our land use demand in our second date, in our calibration map, is just simply how much land we know changed to urban in that date. So there, 1999, 4502. Okay. Right, how do we calculate it in R? There we go. Very simple, frequency command. Um, there we can see we had 6,752 6, cells uh, allocated to urban. Um, that's a demand of 157 cells a year. So at each time step, we need to locate 150 cells of urban land. Yeah. Okay, this is our matrix that we've just seen for our neighbourhood rules. And then uh, we apply a focal moving window yeah, using this command, the focal command. Yeah, and this is the window that we saw before. Okay, um, It does some quite odd things here. I'm not quite sure why. It creates some holes in the map. Uh, so we can fill in these areas uh, from the original map. That's something I should look into more, but I haven't had the time. <laughs> So here we are, here's our neighbourhood filter applied, and we can see, well, basically the green area is where the city was in our first time step, and the areas uh, in yellow and red are on the fringe of the city, and those are areas that have the second highest potential. So the highest potential for transition is in existing urban areas, because I say if you don't, your urban areas walk all over the map. The second highest potentials are going to be on the fringes. Yep, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, the randomness, right, well, sorry for this big slide of code. Um, it's, it's longer than it needs to be because, as you can see, I'm not an expert in R and nor am I a programmer. <laughs> but um, effectively, the viable distribution is a skewed distribution. So this means that we're not, we're not getting values uh, consistently between 0 and 1 like we would in a normal distribution. We're getting values that are, they tend towards 1. So most of our values are going to be 1. And that's really important because we're multiplying it into the transition potential equation. So most of the time, we're going to get determinism. But occasionally, we're going to get values that are not 1. And they can be quite a lot higher than 1. So, so this is how, this is how we've, uh, we've put our, uh, our randomness in. Um, and then we've <laughs> made sure that we set the city to 1. So we're not actually randomizing inside the urban area because this doesn't really fit inside our conceptual model. You know, we believe that it's, there's a possibility for urban areas to randomly occur outside of the existing city, but we don't really want chunks of our city to randomly disappear. You know? <laughs> anyway, um, accessibility. Well, this really is, is um, very straightforward stuff. Uh, in GIS, this is just a reclassification. I mean, I suppose it's not, not very user-friendly, uh, but it's not difficult either. You know, we've got a vector there, and we're saying that uh, everything from minus infinity to 100 is given 1, everything from 100 to 300 is 0 0.9, and so on. So we've got a distance decay effect um <coughs> falling off with a halving distance of about 2.5 kilometres, yeah? So it's, it's half, half its effect at... Uh, 2.5 kilometres away from a road. Um, we can play around with these values. Um, <laughs> we apply the accessibility equation. There we go. And then we plot it out, and that's what we get. Um, it's quite a good display, so we can see that there's actually some white areas uh, inside the roads itself. And uh, why is this, we wonder? Actually, this is because areas that are actually really close to the road, i.e. on the road, are infinitely high. <laughs> And the colour scheme I've got doesn't actually plot infinite values. I don't know, can anything plot infinite values? It's a philosophical question. So I, I need a better colour scheme there. Um, yeah. 
Right, uh, the slope, this is our suitability. I've just chosen a slope map, which is the simplest, most typical example for locating urban land. Generally, urban land uh, is found on slopes of less than about 5%. Um, most of this area is, in fact, less than about 5%. Blocked out in white, by the way, is the protected area. Um, come on to that in a second. So that's our suitability map. And zoning, well, you've got two ways to incorporate it. I chose the simplest, fastest way out, which is just to exclude the uh, no data areas from the model. Um, or you could add it just in the same way that you did suitability as another map with values from 0 to 1. But we've got to remember that if we're returning zeros, we're putting zeros into a multiplying equation, so our result will be zero. Um, so again, we don't want the land use in that. We want it to stay the same. We don't want it to disappear. So we've got to have a little if condition in there. Um, I haven't got around to that because, as I say, I took, the, I took the easy way out. This is my pseudo code. Again, I'm, I repeat, I'm not a programmer. <laughs> so uh, one of the things you'll see here is I've, I've got a loop within a loop. Um, hasn't actually seemed to create me too many problems, but I think there's definitely better ways to do this. And uh, what we're doing is we're, we're running the loop. Um, OK, so we're running the neighborhood rules. We're creating our random map. Then we're calculating our total transition potential just by multiplying these things together. We're extracting the values. And then we're entering a second loop to locate. This is for this, for each time step, 157 cells of urban land. And how do we do this? Well, we take the maximum using the max command and we, and we change it to minus 999. So the second time we go into that loop, that the, uh, we're not picking the same maximum. Okay? It's just a, it's a solution that seemed to work. Um, here's our total transition potential. You can see that we've got this speckle. This speckle effect is because of our random map. So we've got uh, a lot of values in, in cyan there, which are, are 1, or very close to 1. But then there's some, there's some areas which are, which are outside the urban area which have, have higher potential. So anyway, yes. So what I've done here is I've done three simulations to test it. OK? I've got the first one is the one I've been talking about, I've been showing on the slides. In the second one, I've enhanced the randomness by changing the scale parameter here, which is the ex exponent of this. So instead of having it uh, as a half, I've got 0.9. Then a third simulation, I've reduced the neighbourhood influence by a factor of 100, in fact. Um, so this reduces the, uh, the power of the neighbourhood respect to the other variables. Um, right, so this is what I'm trying to simulate. I've got a real map, 1956, very little urban growth there and then this kind of sprawling urban growth with some new uh, irrigation channels. Actually, this is not just urban. This is sort of artificial surfaces um, here anyway. So we've got these irrigation channels in, uh, in 1999. And I'll have a go at it. Um, well, that's the first one. Whew. It's not that good. I mean, it's not, it's not too bad. <laughs> I've managed to grow some land. <laughs> um, but we can improve it. So this is why I, I jacked up the randomness a little bit. Um, and we can, we can actually see that uh, this has the effect. Let me see. It's going to have a think about this. It's going to, if I can go back. Mm, let's think about it. There we go. You can actually see the difference between the first one and the second one. I haven't got um, any, any urban areas that just sort of spring up. But when I up the randomness, they start to, sp they start to spontaneously occur. Um, and then when I reduce the effect of the neighbourhood, respect to the other variables, I start to get a more realistic pattern. Um, I say more realistic because this is very, very clumped, isn't it? But we're starting to see some sort of fraying at the edges. And this is possibly starting to be able to simulate a little bit this, this spread along the coast. So anyway, that, that was the best simulation I came up with. Well, it's more or less realistic. It looks, at least it looks like land use. I've seen a lot of simulations that look like, you know, sort of mushrooms or algae blooms. Um, this doesn't look like that. It seems to be growing step by step. Um, there's some problems. Uh, we've got some good things. Some smaller urban patches do spring up spontaneously, which reflects reality to a certain extent. There's a bit of linear dispersion reflecting the influence of the accessibility. I need to take the irrigation channels out of this map, as you can see, because <laughs> uh, we, uh, uh, we don't grow new irrigation channels alongside existing ones. Now, these are problems that can be solved. Um, 
Right, and I hope I've got time to just quickly go into the statistical. Two minutes, right, very quickly. Um, okay, I've used Kappa, which is a standard uh, map comparison technique, and I haven't used unmodified Kappa, because uh, this causes some problems. It doesn't take into account areas of no change. So we've used this modified statistic from Van Vliet. This is programmed by a colleague of mine. Um, I, I'm not going to show it to you because it is, it's not ready yet. <laughs> but, but anyway, it works, and we're going to package it up and, and make sure that it's available. How do we know it's any good? Well, higher than 0.1, usually you have to take my word for it, I'm afraid, but <laughs> if you look at the literature, higher than 0.1, you're, you're starting to be able to simulate uh, growth effectively. Well, fractal dimension, this is, again, this is a pattern comparison measure. Um, in general, the closer between 1 and 2, the closer to 2, uh, the more dispersed or the more sprawling, the more irregular the pattern. So we can see in our real maps, we've got quite a dispersed uh, pattern, quite dispersed boundaries in our simulations, not so dispersed. Remedy, more randomness, stronger accessibility perhaps to, to scatter those urban areas along the roads. Um, and then what I've done is I've taken this and I've applied it to the real map in 2007 with the same uh, growth tendency, 157 cells a year up to 2050. Uh, so there it is, there it is working. And that's almost the last slide. I'll just let that finish. Okay, right. Well, I'd like to put the full, the full script up. I haven't done it yet, as I said. Um, the real prize would be to add the capability to model multiple land uses. You just need to be able to sort. You have you would have a high, each each uh, uh, land use would have its own transition potential matrix, and you need to sort out. Uh, which of those uh, is the highest for each particular cell between the different land uses. Something we've done in Python, but we haven't done it in R yet. Um, we're going to apply it. And this is just a tiny little bit of publicity, <laughs> sorry about that, for, for our project, FP7 project, uh, complexity in low carbon energy systems, climate change and land use. So we're going to try and uh, apply some of these, some of these techniques. Um, and that's me. Please feel free to contact me. Uh, that's that's the end. Any any questions? Josh, you talked about introducing randomness, mm. um, but your final twenty fifty forecast mm. didn't have any representation of uncertainty in the map. It was a, a deterministic forecast. In what sense? Um, you only produced one map of, okay, it's a forecast, but it's mm. um, this is what it will be in 2050, not there's a 50% mm. chance that this yes. will be Oh, I see what you mean, so yeah, you yeah. Monte Carlo analysis or, or something along those yeah. lines to produce a, mm. um, a probability rather than just a yes or no answer. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're, totally, you're totally right. I mean, in, in no circumstance would I want to say this is what it'll be like in 2050. I suppose that's just an example I've given to show how you you know you would run this forward into the future but yeah absolutely you'd want to do you know a whole series of runs hundreds you know as many as you've got time for and then put them together absolutely and give a, a nice probability you know what are the probability of particular areas to change i t totally agree yeah how long does the model take to run the model takes about about 20 minutes on my laptop so it's 43 43 years it's not very fast, but neither is it so slow that it gives you a headache. Um, I think if we start trying to introduce other, other land uses, I'd have to, we'd have to try and look at modifying the code. I think R offers the facility to escape a little bit from loops, but I'm not sure exactly how that works. But I'd be very happy if someone could tell me. Any other questions for Richard? Yeah. I know you've only got two data points to start yeah. with, but You mean, you mean the demand would not be a sort of a, a straight line, but rather a... Um, well, <laughs> you, you can do it. Um, yeah. I mean, that would be interesting for your future, for your... I mean, I suppose to simulate the future, you might want a series of scenarios in which the growth does a, a, a series of things. 
And uh, I mean, that's definitely been the case in Spain. You know, we've had kind of years and years and years and years of consistent urban growth. And all of these models have been great. You know, business as usual, it's always the same. It just keeps on growing. And then suddenly we have the economic crisis in 2007. And that just throws everything out of the window. So that's a clear kind of weakness in these models, I think. Hmm. Yeah. You've obviously got a, uh, something going on with your um, irrigation channels. Yes. You could. Uh, how does it, or is there a way of incorporating the reverse effect? That say someone builds a road. Yeah. And then you get development off of that. Hmm. Yes. I mean, you can. Again, you could incorporate. I mean, I think it, it would be easy enough to introduce a new map at a particular time step that could have new road development. And as, as soon as that happens, it, that's, that can then be calculated. And, and then you, you will get new, ro you, new things coming up off that new map. Put, put a feed into the, into the looping Yeah, definitely. That would, be, that would be really good. And that would actually, that would improve it, really, I think, because quite a lot of the, I mean, the model, uh, the Metronamica model that, uh, that we've used, the commercial version, is quite static in that sense. And it doesn't offer that flexibility. So, yeah. Not for the same area, but I can. I just haven't had time. I can do because I've got the same model and the same commercial software. Perhaps I should do that and put it on the on the on the blog. That that would be interesting. In theory, it should be identical. If I put the same rules in, it should be identical. That would be the test, wouldn't it? <laughs> so sorry, I haven't had time to do it. <laughs> Yeah.